everyone. So let me just introduce myself um, to those who, who may not have met me. My name's Joy Kemp, as you know, and I've been the uh, one of two global professional advisors for the Royal College of Midwives, and that was a new role that was developed within the last three years um, as the RCM has been undertaking more global work. Um, and my background is as a midwife teacher, also um, some research and as a practicing midwife, but more importantly, I've spent about 11 years working in overseas development, so hopefully that's given me a good background for this role. I'm just going to ask Eleanor if you would introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi, I'm Eleanor Shaw. I'm the Global Projects Officer and I do the admin for the global team. I work really closely with Joy to deliver lots of different global projects. Um, so hopefully I'm going to be supporting her today and keeping her on track. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. So um, I think before we talk about the global role of the Royal College of Midwives and our profile of global work, it's important just to remind ourselves what the need is for midwives across the world. And I'm sorry if I'm teaching grannies to suck eggs because I'm sure that many of you that are listening are already very familiar with the global need. Um, but I just highlighted a few points that are worth mentioning. So in, in 2013, across the world, there were 289,000 maternal deaths, 3 million newborn deaths, and 2.6 million stillbirths. So if we compare those to the situation in the UK, I think we can see that really in the UK we're extremely fortunate. And I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the Millennium Development Goals, which have been running between the years 2000 and 2015. To, uh, uh, there are eight goals, and of those eight, three of them were related to midwifery. Um, Global uh, Millennium Development Goal 4 was around child health, Goal 5 was around maternal health, and Goal 6 was around um, HIV prevention. And if we look at 4, just looking at that figure of 3 million newborn deaths, what we find in Goal 4 is that although child deaths have reduced by a half or more over the 15 years of the Millennium Development Goals, Within that, newborn mortality has stayed pretty stagnant. And so it's really important that we don't just think about maternal deaths, but we also consider not only newborn deaths, but the number of stillbirths, many of which are just not recognized as a, as a birth at all. So there's some grim statistics. And we know that actually midwives are the people who are best placed to address those needs and they're the best buy in public health and in fact investing in midwives can give you up to a 16 times return on your investment so it's a key message for governments to invest in midwives and that actually we don't shouldn't be talking about skilled birth attendants or community midwifery technicians or all the other ways that people try to get away with not investing in midwifery, but actually it is midwives which are needed. And investing in midwives can save millions of lives every year. And there are four key actions around um, global health as we look forward following the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. Just going down to the to the bottom of the slide, the, the AAAQ, which is the, the kind of buzz phrase that everyone's talking about at the moment, as we move forward to 2030, um, this is what we're focusing on around midwifery, about making sure that midwifery care is available, that it's accessible, that it is acceptable, because people aren't going to want to come and see a midwife in a health facility, for example, if they, the care they receive is not respectful. So it's about acceptable care and also about the quality of care. So that's just in a nutshell the global need. Right, now, just thinking about, we, we've considered the global need. What about um, the RCM? Why do we think that we, as a UK midwifery association, should be working globally? Well, 
The International Confederation of Midwives says that if you want to have a strong midwifery profession, then there are three pillars of midwifery. So you can see on this slide, there are three pillars on the left hand side, education, regulation and association. And these three pillars sit on a bedrock of quality midwifery care um, and, and the international midwifery competencies that are set by the ICM. So we want to be strengthening simultaneously midwifery regulation, education and association. And as you can see here from the RCM's professional strategy that that's really what we're all about. We're about promoting um, safe quality care normality, education and training, excellence in regulation, leadership. So really those three pillars are absolutely integral to what we as a professional association do in the UK, but we have and you'll see it highlighted in pink there, we have as part of our strategy that we want to influence, promote and support global midwifery to improve maternal and child health across the world. So we're, we're very clear about what we are and what we're not. We're not an NGO, we're not a charity, well we do have charitable status, but we're not a Save the Children or um, a UNFPA, we're not a UN agency, we are a professional association. And I think that's where we have something to offer because we can help to develop professional associations and also influence education and regulation. Um, so that's very much where we see, see ourselves and um, I think we're, we're really just developing our global programme. We started doing operational global work around three years ago and so this is very much a work in progress for us and it's very exciting for me to be um, helping to lead the work. Um, I want to thank Jackie Gerrard who's our England director for this slide and it's just a um, collection of, of different documents that were published in 2013 and 14. 2014 was a fantastic year for midwifery because there was a publication of some really key documents that give us the evidence we need for why midwives are needed in global health. So we've got the Lancet midwifery series, um, which the there were several documents that were published last year, but in fact there are still some more publications coming out, which is really exciting. Um, the State of the World's Midwifery, and that's a joint publication between WHO and ICM and UNFPA um, and then WHO also produced every newborn action plan so there's a number of different documents and it was a, it's a really exciting time. On our website we've been developing a list of, of resources and links for our members so if you visit our website you go to um, www.rcm.org.uk forward slash global you'll find on the right hand side resources for global work many of the links to these documents. Oh, I think that one came in twice so we'll just go on. Right, Eleanor, would you be able to just so very so people don't get bored of my voice, would you be able to just talk us through what the RCM has been doing um, as our current profile of global projects? Yeah, absolutely. So the biggest project that we've been doing that ran from 2012 to 2015 was the GMTP project, which stands for Global Midwifery Twinning Project. Many of you might have heard of it. And that was across three countries. So that was working in Uganda, Nepal and Cambodia. And that was um, the point of that was to twin our professional association with professional midwifery associations in Nepal, Cambodia and Uganda to try and strengthen midwifery through those professional associations, looking at the three pillars, so education, regulation and association. And as part of our work, we also looked quite a lot of practice in those three countries. So that project came to an end in March 2015. And I'm happy to say that we're really actively exploring opportunities to continue to work in those countries. And we currently have some bids um, out to funded to, to continue that work. We also have a project that's part of a much bigger Women for Health project working in northern Nigeria and that's run by Mandy Forrester for the RCM. 
and she's working at using virtual twinning, so um, taking UK midwife educators and twinning them in an individual twinning relationship with mid midwife educators in northern Nigeria. Um, so there's some really interesting work going on there that's all about trying to improve the numbers of um, female health workers to try and access female uh, service users in northern Nigeria. And then we also have a project with VSO, Voluntary Service Overseas, that's been taking place in Malawi and that also is just coming to an end. So that's been working with nurses and midwives um, to do some health system strengthening. Um, and we are also looking at forming our own relationship with Malawi um, as a result of that project. So that's a really exciting development. Great, thanks very much, Alana. So, um, let's just focus for a short while on the Global Midwifery Twinning Project, which Alana talked about, which was in Cambodia and Nepal and Uganda. We may have online some of the volunteers from the Global Midwifery Twinning Project, so if so, delighted you can join us and uh, thanks very much for all your involvement with the project. I love this picture. This was taken in Prague when we brought all our twins to the International Confederation of Midwives Conference and we had a workshop on the middle Saturday uh, and it was just really great to have everybody together with Leslie, our president, you can see in the middle, um, and Kathy at the back and I'm sitting next to Leslie in the Ugandan uh, colourful top if you're not sure what I look like. Um, so the project had three main interventions and I don't know if Emma Morris is online but this is a picture of Emma Morris who's a midwife from England who went to Uganda twice with the project. Um, the three interventions of the project were firstly workshops and these were identified through uh, the needs for these workshops were identified through using a tool that comes from the International Confederation of Midwives and it's called the MACAT, which is the Midwifery Association Capacity Assessment Tool. And it's a self-assessment tool that midwifery associations can use to identify what their needs are and then to plan strategies to address those needs. So the workshops were based on those needs and they covered a variety of different topics such as advocacy, strategic planning, um, many other topics and, and really interesting. Some of them were facilitated by us, some of them by external facilitators and some were done in-house. And then the second intervention was volunteer placements and we actually had 75 volunteer placements over the three years, over the three countries and those were RCM members with very specific skills that matched the needs that the midwifery associations had uh, that they had identified through the MACAT exercise and we were fortunate to have many many of our members volunteering um, uh, some of whom were very senior we had professors consultant midwives heads of midwifery labor ward managers midwifery educators um, specialist midwives, lots and lots of, of different midwives. And then the third intervention was support from the RCM and that's both from our global team and I want here just to say a big thank you to Delicia who um, was in Eleanor's role previously at the beginning of the project and did a huge amount of work in supporting the project. Uh, but also to our country directors um, for England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland and I'm not sure if any of them are listening in but if so we're really grateful for all your support and uh, technical help with the project. <clears throat> what I want to do because I can't really um, talk about all of the project in the time that we've got allowed is just to share a, a short case study about Nepal. The reason I focused on Nepal of course is because the context has really changed from when we were doing the project with two big earthquakes in April and May and I wanted to just share a case study about what happened during the project before the earthquake and how that has enabled the Midwifery Association to respond um, to the current situation. So we all know Nepal is where Mount Everest is, it's a very rural 
and mountainous hilly context which makes it extremely difficult to access health workers um, and 64% of the population give birth without help and 84% live in rural areas. There are no midwives in Nepal, there's no, no uh, separate title of midwife so you can't register as a midwife and you can't undertake midwifery education but the Ministry of Health is really committed to making that happen and so it was really timely for us to have the twinning project where we could help to prepare the ground for a profession of midwifery to come in. There's this funny situation where you've got 64% of women giving birth without help in the rural areas but then in the urban areas you've got a caesarean section academic which really shows the need for midwives and it's, it's not just about access to care but it's also about the quality of care and disrespect and abuse are very common um, where women give birth in facilities. So when we started the project, the Trivavan University Teaching Hospital in Kathmandu was very keen to set up a model birth centre, a midwife-led birth centre. Um, this was really supported by the Ministry of Health and also by the Midwifery Society of Nepal, MIDSON. And they wanted it to be a centre where when midwifery came in, student midwives could understand what the role of a midwife was and to learn how to be a midwife, to acquire those skills and the knowledge and the attitudes that go along with, with being a midwife. And so we set about, through the project, helping Midson to develop a birth centre at the teaching hospital. And this is a picture that was taken on my last trip to Nepal back in March with the staff from the birth centre. And you can see the lovely environment with mattresses and uh, pictures on the walls and nice colourful bed covers. Uh, so it's a real change if you could see the, um, the obstetric ward, it's really, really different. That's just a picture that these lovely bed covers were donated by the sister of, of Manjit, one of our GMTP volunteer midwives, who's from St. Thomas's Hospital in London, and they really make the atmosphere very nice. And this is um, Bina on the left, who's one of the midwives in charge, proudly showing a poster that was developed uh, by Sarah Gregson, one of the volunteers who comes from Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust. And that's Kalpana on the right showing the uh, customer satisfaction questionnaire survey that was developed as part of it. So the volunteers, uh, four cohorts of volunteers, really helped to develop the site, to get it, get it all equipped and to train the staff, to develop the um, uh, operational plan, uh, operational guidelines for the birth centre and then also to help them to reach out to the community to make sure that it was well used and to develop tools where they could audit their practice and their outcomes to make sure that they had the evidence for what they were doing. So it's just some lovely baby pictures. <laughs> the picture at the top is the first baby who was born at the birth centre back in June a year ago now with Anne Walker and Michelle Mackey, two of the volunteers uh, who were there for that birth. And then just recently we were sent a picture of the 86th baby to be born in the birth centre. This was a couple of months ago, so I suspect they're up to around 100 births by now. Oh, my time is done, so we're nearly finished. And on the left, just a, a lovely, happy family that I interviewed on video for the um, final evaluation of our project. And this woman was saying that when she had her first baby in the obstetric unit, she was so frightened. Nobody was allowed to be with her, not her husband, no family member. She was left on her own. She was flat on her back with her legs in stirrups. A whole package of, of um, poor care, really. And she just couldn't speak more highly of the birth centre and the way that her partner was allowed to be with her, that she had respectful care, she felt loved by the midwives, uh, she attributed how well she felt and how well her baby was to the care that she'd received and they're just the greatest advocates for the birth centre. 
So I think this is just one story, and there are many like it from the Global Midwifery Twinning Project of how it's made a real difference to the quality of care in Nepal and, and in other countries, but also um, in, in Nepal particularly has provided a role model for the development of the midwifery profession, which is really exciting. We can't talk about Nepal without acknowledging the earthquake. Um, and there's just some pictures I got from the internet of the difference in one village on the left and on the right uh, before and after the earthquake. And it, it affected both rural and urban areas. Um, I'm sure that everyone's very familiar with these pictures from the TV. We were faced with uh, the need to make a decision about how to respond because we are a twinning partner with Midson. And when do you need a twin? Well, you, you arguably need your twin when there's a crisis. Um, Eleanor, I don't know if you just want to talk us through the various ways that Midson have been responding to the crisis. So Midson uh, really came up with an incredible response. They're a very small uh, new midwifery society. But the very first thing that they decided to do was set up a help desk at the main maternity hospital. So women were flooding in from across the country, really, uh, the whole earthquake affected zone, and um, to get midwifery care. And of course, the hospital was a complete deluge. So they set up a help desk to give advice and signpost people. The next stage was really the outreach camps. So as I'm sure you're all aware, many people have been staying outside under tarpaulins because their homes were damaged or they were too scared to go back. And these obviously included lots of families, lots of pregnant women. So the Midsun executive decided to form into teams and go out and deliver basic care, uh, antenatal care to families, to pregnant women uh, in lots of different camps. And then the next stage was that UNICEF have decided to partner with Midsun and they are, uh, UNICEF are funding 12 midwives I think overall to um, be provided with skills and, and supervision by Midsun and then to go out into the most earthquake affected areas to work with communities in this immediate phase just after the earthquake to really provide that um, that healthcare that's so lacking in so many of the of the most affected areas. So Midsun's response is ongoing, but already you can see how much work they've been doing uh, as soon as the earthquake hit to really respond to this situation, and we're completely committed to supporting them however we can to continue with that. That's great, thank you. And the, the bottom bit on that slide, which I think has just slipped off, says midwifery advocates. And what they're hoping to do, and what we're hoping to use some of the funds raised uh, through our campaign to, to help them with, is to have a programme of midwifery advocacy. What uh, they've been saying is that the quality of care has really suffered as midwives themselves are living in such difficult conditions. Many of them have lost their homes. Um, the, the quality of the midwifery care um, has really fallen away. Nobody's supporting breastfeeding. Um, there's no therapeutic touch of, of women. And Midson really want to put a response in to go and almost to midwife the midwives and also to midwife the women. Um, so we're, we're just going to wait and see how that develops. So very briefly, because we need to finish, where are we now? Well, we're sort of in a phase of finishing and reflecting, moving on. We've uh, been trying very hard to disseminate information about our global work, and particularly the project. And um, so we've produced a booklet, a glossy booklet, and you can download a PDF of that booklet from our website. We also had a four-page spread in Midwives magazine, which was published um, just at the end of May, so hopefully everyone's received a copy of that, but you can also download that four page spread as a PDF from our website. Um, we're doing this webinar, we're doing a number of conference presentations. I was at the Normal Birth Research Conference last week in uh, the Lake District giving a presentation, and I'm off to Wales and then to Bradford and Sheffield, so we're doing a, a lot of project dissemination. We know there's some 
opportunities for research and we're just trying to think through what that might might look like um, we're, we're sustaining our training relationships we're in contact at least once a month with our partners actually a lot more with uh, Uganda and Nepal at the moment and, and and probably a bit more than that with Cambodia so we're very um, we're very committed to sustaining our twinning relationships we are also developing new projects and partnerships down the bottom you can see Uganda and Malawi bids we've been shortlisted for a project to support mid midwifery mentorship development in Uganda and we had a second interview yesterday so watch this space for that we've also put a bid in to develop a new twinning relationship in Malawi and there's a number of spin-offs from the Global Midwifery Twinning Project. Particular note is uh, Salford that have developed a link with Cambodia. So there's lots going on and just because our projects are kind of in a in a hiatus phase at the moment certainly doesn't mean that the global team has nothing to do. Um, I'm not going to run through all of the results and you can read these in the booklet. But the evaluation of the Global Midwifery Twinning Project showed that it had really made an impact on midwifery education regulation and practice and had strength and capacity. I think what's really interesting for us is that we found that our global work engages our members and when people have volunteered with us they actually come back and become activists for the Royal College of Midwives. So we found that really interesting and we really want to capitalize on that in the future of our global work. There's lots that we need to learn about the project. I think it was very ambitious and we do need to think through more carefully, I think, the theoretical basis for what we're doing, how we want to engage and how we want to facilitate change. And that's something we're taking very seriously. And in fact, next week I'm going on a training course with the International Confederation of Midwives, looking at theories of change and monitoring evaluation. We also want to try and maximise the learning that our partners can have from each other in a south-to-south -south capacity. Um, so we're going to finish up here. We've, we've just put some links together uh, with opportunities for any of you who are listening who want to volunteer. At the moment, we don't have any opportunities within the RCM. We may well have soon, so certainly keep your eye open. But meanwhile, um, there's a number of people that we work closely with that we'd be happy to uh, recommend to you, and particularly the SO and the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine Making It Happen programme, Maternity Worldwide, MSF. There's lots of opportunities and if you would like to email me or Eleanor to talk about any of those organisations or opportunities, we'd be delighted to um, help you with that. As I've said, we've developed our website and it's got lots of case studies, videos, booklets and publications on there. So you can have a look at that and you can share those with people in your units or with, with friends and family.